The Fazbear Fanverse is one of the coolest things Scott Cawthon has ever done. Unfortunately, the Fanverse had a hidden dark side. Competition, betrayal, sabotage, friendships destroyed, years of hard work left abandoned to decay into nothing. The Fazbear Fanverse initiative is probably dead. I actually sort of anticipated this a few months back when I released this video, concerned that the Fanverse had become more trouble than it was worth for Scott. I think most would agree that this was the case, especially in light of some of the crazy stuff that went down with prospective Fanverse devs recently. I don't think Scott will be accepting any other fanverse entries after the recent issues, not just the pair, but also things like Aftonbilt and Jonochrome. In my first fanverse video, I described the initiative as one of the coolest things that Scott Cawthon has ever done, and I stand by that. There's zero doubt in my mind that this project was born out of a genuine effort to uplift young up-and-coming developers and reward them for their often thankless efforts. Flumpty's 3, controversy aside, was pretty excellent in terms of visuals and mechanics, and what we've seen of FNAF Plus looks fantastic. Beyond on the games, the Fanverse initiative has certainly contributed to the thriving fan game ecosystem that FNAF sees today. So what happened? How did a project born out of the FNAF creator's desire to give back to a community he loved so much end up nearly tearing it apart? We know from Aftonbilt and Final Nights developer Liam that Scott started reaching out to Fanverse devs a few months prior to the official announcement. Presumably, Kane, Emil, Fiznom, Nixon, and Jonochrome had similar experiences. They were all well-established fan game developers at this point, and each had proven their ability to actually finish their projects and release them to the world. They'd established fan bases and reputations and there was really obvious mutual benefit to these relationships. To the fanverse's credit, most of these games are going fine. Flumpty's 3 was great, FNAF Plus looks sick, while Pop Goes Evergreen and Candies are clearly moving along in development. However, the fanverse announcement had an enormous impact on the existing FNAF fan game scene. Up until now, the notion that anyone could get their fan game published and get funding for it was completely off the table. Nobody even considered it. According to Kane Carter, the prospect of being able to sell your series to Scott made the fan game scene extremely competitive, rushed, and aggressive. Just like this call to action. Subscribe right now to make this puppy happy. Also, follow me on Twitter, but only if you have a Twitter. If you don't already have a Twitter, it's it's not really worth it. But if you have one, follow me. Fan game developers also started to create projects that were effectively contingent on being accepted into the fanverse. We saw this with Aftonbilt. The team literally could not move forward without a contract from Scott, and when Scott didn't give them that contract, the project fell apart. In a very insightful comment on my first Fanverse video, Martin Walls, creator of The Walton Files, confirmed that the Fanverse had reached out to him, expressing interest in his project. He went on to explain that he ultimately declined the offer as he felt it would constrain him creatively. He didn't want to tie his project to the whims of one person who may not share the same vision as him. I feel this was exactly the problem with the Fanverse. The promise of funding and publication inspired fan game developers to dream really big. They conceived of projects that probably never should have been fan games. They weren't fan games. They were ambitious indie games with large teams and necessitating large budgets, sort of disguised as fan games for the sake of qualifying for the fanverse. The fanverse had the unintended consequence of encouraging developers to devote a huge amount of time and resources into projects, trying to make them stand out against the countless other fanverse hopefuls. This would be fine if Scott's intention was to start licensing out FNAF to any studio with a decent pitch, but that was obviously never what the fanverse was about. Kane Carter seems to agree, saying, The fanverse should have always been a celebration of a small amount of successful fan games rather than something you can apply for. Normally when a team makes a game and the publisher they're in talks with ends up passing on it, it's fine because there are hundreds of other publishers they can go to, many of whom may share their vision for the project. However, these big fanverse pitches relied entirely on getting Scott Cawthon on board. Scott owns the Five Nights at Freddy's intellectual property and he's the only one in the world world who can license it to you. The fanverse was unintentionally incentivizing developers to devote huge amounts of effort to risky projects, all in the hopes that they'd be able to get it in front of Scott and that he shares their vision for the project and is willing to hand them money. If for whatever reason that doesn't pan out, the whole project is basically dead. It's a single brittle point of failure for every one of these projects and it's way too risky. How do you apply for the fanverse? You don't. You're picked. Don't expect to be, especially now. How do I get picked for the fanverse? Who knows? knows. Don't make FNAF fan games with the expectation that you'll ever be considered for the fanverse. The vast majority won't. When Kane Carter was making the early Pop Ghost titles, when Fiznom made a Shadow Over Freddy's, or when Emil made the Candy series, when the early Flumpty's 
titles were coming out. There was no fanverse. There was no chance of getting published or getting paid. There was no fame or fortune. These people did it out of passion, and after working hard, proving themselves, and finding success, they were rewarded with a very specific cool opportunity. If you want to make FNAF fan games because you love FNAF, and maybe you want to hone your skills as a developer with a smaller project that has a built-in fanbase to provide you with feedback, that's a great idea. If it's really successful, even better. Producing something popular that lots of people enjoy will always yield rewards. It may not mean Scott tapping you on the shoulder and admitting you into a secret society of fan game developers, but you can still do what people like Kane Carter and Emil did. You can still make a popular fan game series that garners its own fan base and becomes something bigger. Who knows, Scott may even reach out to you someday and work something out. Don't count on it though. If you do, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Finally, I've seen a lot of games recently that are FNAF derivative yet do not utilize the FNAF IP. They have their own characters, their own story, their own expression of gameplay mechanics. They're not fan games. I think a lot of these games were riding this thin line of, well, we're obviously inspired by FNAF and we want to keep the option of fanverse inclusion open, so we're calling this a fan game, even though it's really not one. I really hope to see this stop. As Kane pointed out during my live stream, fan games like Tealerland, Rat Race, and others can totally be sold if they want. Kane cites Case Animatronics, The Dolls, and Alien Blackout as other examples. You can be inspired by FNAF, make a game about spooky robots in a restaurant, and sell it. Just use your own characters. The fanverse is probably dead now anyway, so there's really no point in tying your game to FNAF if you don't need to. All it does is constrain you in the long run. It does offer some promotional value, people are more likely to show interest in your game if it includes iconic characters and names. However, games like Rat Race are still up there on Game Jolt in the FNAF section with FNAF fan games. It's clearly benefiting from being a FNAF derivative game despite not using FNAF characters. The Walton Files is similar. It obviously derived a lot of its initial interest from those of us in the FNAF community who were predisposed to be interested in a story like that. However, it uses its own characters and Martin is free to do whatever he wants with it and monetize it however he pleases. He has control over his series. I hope that with the likely end of the fanverse, we see a renaissance of original games that are simply inspired by FNAF. I hope that Rat Race is sold as a commercial product. These devs work really hard on these games, and I don't think it's fair that we as a community push back against them charging for their work simply because it uses a similar aesthetic to FNAF or because it was made by someone who has historically released free fan games. I think we need to reevaluate the term fan game because I don't consider a lot of this stuff fan game. Sure, Tealerland is surely a fan-made project inspired by the Five Nights at Freddy's game series, but it's not a fan game. This is a, a game. It's a game. Just sell the thing for a couple bucks if you want to. You can even say the game was inspired by FNAF and still sell it. Developers have cited inspirations for their games forever, it's nothing new. I suspect developers are afraid that we as a community would reject the notion of paying for games that were clearly inspired by FNAF. I think there's this idea that once they add those FNAF tags to the Game Jolt page and proclaim a FNAF association, the game has to be free. And that's silly. If your game doesn't use the FNAF IP, it doesn't need to be a fan game at all. Fan games should be small projects, made by at most a couple of people. They should be a way to develop your skills and get lots of feedback quickly from a built-in audience. However, once you're ready to do something big, do your own thing, don't constrain yourself. I love FNAF fan games and they've gotten a handful of developers their start, but you can't rely on making a career out of them. I suspect that most of the fanverse developers will move on to original non-FNAF projects afterwards, and that's good. Fan games should be a jumping off point for aspiring developers, and they never should have become this ultra-competitive thing. The motivations and intentions behind the fanverse were obviously good, but in hindsight there were unintended effects that were damaging our community. I think it's best that Scott pulls the plug on the whole thing. Perhaps he'll license other fan games in the future, but it should be on a case by case basis. Nobody should be applying for the fanverse. Make your fan game because you want to make a fan game and expect nothing in return. Thanks for watching.